Shalom and welcome to this week's Bible study. I hope everyone's having a great day and a good week. And uh, today's been quite eventful for me. I had, I was outside trying to get yard work done with my brother and stuff. And I was, uh, first I had a wood bee get caught up in my hair. <laughs> At least they don't have stingers. But then my brother was afraid it was a bumblebee. And I was like, don't let it sting me, don't let it sting me. And so he took, he ran out of the house and got two shoes and actually smashed it and got it out. And that was kind of a mess. And then, uh, and we got that all taken care of and got my hair cleaned up and stuff. And then later, we was out there walking and I went out to let the dog in. And then I came back in and a wasp flew in the house. And so I was going to open the door back up. And I opened the door back up and went outside hoping that the wasp would just fly out. And I got a little bit impatient, and so I tried to come back in. I was going to, like, try to coax it out without making it angry, and it came around trying to attack me. <laughs> well, when I went, when I walked into the house, it decided to try to fly out, and we kind of met by accident. And it was really hot out, and my glasses had fallen down some. Uh, and somehow that wasp got stuck between my glasses and my eye. And by some miracle, I closed my eye fast enough, and when it stung me, it stung my eyelid and not my eyeball. Thank God for that, because I've heard of people, you know, people do get stung in the eyeballs sometimes, and uh, some, a lot of times you have to go to the eye doctor and get treatment, and <laughs> that's quite terrible. But uh, it did sting me in the eyelid, and, you know, it finally got, and I guess it, like, got stuck because I could feel the stinger, it was in me for a few seconds, and I could feel the wasp trying to pull, and it was, like, stuck, and he finally got it pulled out and flew off. Um, he didn't lose a stinger, it, I didn't have a stinger in me, um, but, man, that hurt, and, uh, so, and I had never been stung by a wet, red wasp before, I was stung by a bumblebee when I was a teenager, and I didn't have any kind of allergic reaction. But then a couple of years ago, I was um, bit or stung by something on my hands when I was walking in a wood pile, which I think they may have been fire ants, but I've been stung a bit by fire ants a lot and never had an allergic reaction. And that day I did start to have an allergic reaction. My throat started to close up. I started to have trouble breathing. And um, we've got a full acre, and the house is about three quarters back. And I was all the way up on the front fence line trying to get with some the people that lived here before they just piled up a bunch of wood at the fence line in front so I was trying to move all that into a more hidden area in the yard to be able to you know burn it and stuff and uh so uh I'm out there walking and my and I still and I knew I was getting bit and stung by fire ants, which I've never had a problem with that it doesn't really hurt or itch uh, it doesn't itch at all, and it doesn't really hurt that bad. So I was out there. I knew I was getting stung a bit by then, but I had never had any trouble. Um, and that day, I don't know if it was because it was my hands and not my feet, and my hands were closer to my heart and stuff, or if it was that I had been bit so much um, that day, or maybe it wasn't a fire ant that got that caused the problem. It might have been, you know, I was walking in a wood pile like that, and it could have been like a centipede. Or a spider or something, which is more what my brother thinks because he's like, you've been, you know, stung and bit by fire ants your whole life and never had a problem. So it sounds like it, at that time, it may have been like a centipede or something. And I actually started to, like, have an allergic reaction and had trouble breathing and stuff. And so I ran court about three quarters of an acre to get back in the house. And I was praying and because we live kind of out in the front country. And I know if someone goes in the anaphylactic shock, you know, they can die within minutes and, you know, sometimes ambulance and people can't get there fast enough. And I was praying, God, you know, make this stop, help me. And I ran in here and I had just bought a new, an updated version of the sound therapy, life frequency sound therapy uh, software that I have. And I had went through it and was looking at all the new presets and stuff. And I had seen anaphylactic shock and God reminded me of that. And, you know, the symptoms weren't coming on. They were coming on kind of slow. They weren't coming on really fast and deadly because I started praying. I started feeling better. And God said, go do your sound therapy. Turn that on and use it. And then I came running to the house and I told mom, my throat's closing up. I'm having allergic reaction. You might have to call 911. And I said, I'm going to try the sound therapy. Don't call them yet. And so, 
if she came in, she had the, I think she had the phone with her and everything just in case. And I turned the sound therapy on. I was already feeling better because I had prayed. And when that hit, I could feel, you know, the swelling in my hands went down. I started breathing. The swelling in my throat went down. And I didn't have to call anyone. And um, so, you know, I did have, like, some kind of allergic reaction to something a couple of years ago that had bit me or stung me. And since I had never been stung by a red wasp today, I was like, I was just praying, God, don't let me have an allergic reaction. Don't let me go into anaphylactic shock because it's kind of worried, you know, am I allergic to this? I didn't know. Um, and my and I was screaming. I ended up saying it stung me and it hurts. And um, my mom ran and got me uh, some ice. And, my, and I said, I don't know what to do about bee stings. And, uh, you know, we just don't, we hardly ever get stung. So... Like, I haven't been stung since I was a teenager. That's been over 20 years. My brother hasn't been stung since he was a child about 30 years ago. And so my brother goes and gets on the internet and starts looking up what to do for stings. And he's like, uh, wash it with soap and water, put ice on it. And uh, then we found out I need to put vinegar on it. And so we did all that. And I took uh, zeolite twice. I drank zeolite twice because it will take all poison everything out of the body walking internally and he'll go and take it out and so I took that and um and it didn't swell up real bad I didn't have that allergic reaction um it swelled up some and then I prayed that God would just fully heal it and take take the symptoms away and after I prayed that it like really started to mend and the swelling went down um and the redness went away and the pain and stuff got started going down it still hurt some tonight and I don't know if you can see it, but it's pretty much normal with the other one. Like, I think the swelling is gone. And I don't know if you can see that through the camera. But um, it, it has swelled up about, probably about double, about 50% bigger than normal. Um, I saw some pictures on the internet where, like, the whole eye was, like, this big, like, an orange. <laughs> it didn't get that bad. So, but, yeah, I had quite an eventful day. So, hopefully, your your day has been a little bit less exciting than mine in, in, a, in a way like that. <laughs> you didn't get, like, bee stings and stuff. Um, but God still took care of me, and I'm feeling okay tonight. Uh, it still hurts a little bit, and I think it may be a little swollen still, but it's a lot better. So, And I didn't have an allergic reaction. It was just pretty much a normal sting. And it didn't, you know, I'm just glad it didn't sting me in the eye. And then my mother, you know, she goes out there and uses about three cans of, <laughs> about three cans of uh, wasp uh, raid spray trying to kill all the wasps and would, would be because they're just all over the place out there. Uh, we we have them really bad this year. So um, we have orcan come out every year between April and October to spray the yard. And they're supposed to come within the next couple of weeks. So. They'll be, hopefully, and that usually helps reduce them quite a bit. I was like, man, they are getting bad this year because my brother had one fly in his eye one day a few about a week ago, but it didn't sting him. It like ran into his eye and then flew out, and it didn't sting him. And my brother's like, man, they're bad this year. They keep trying to get into our eyes. <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with them. And so, uh, hopefully, when Orkin gets out here and sprays the yard real good this year, that will help get rid of them. I did mow the grass today. So that should help uh, deter them too. That usually helps deter bugs and stuff. It was the first mowing of the season, and it was about it's about the highest it could get without it being a real problem to mow. It was about three inches high, so three four inches high, um, and it was it was time to I had to get it mowed. Um, and I was actually heading out to I was just about to go get gasoline for the mower because I ran out of gas and just died in the middle of the yard. And when I got stung, um, and then it was like an hour later before I could go because I wanted to make sure I wasn't going to go in the shop because I had read that I could go in the shop up to about an hour, maybe a little bit more after being stung. Um, so we stayed home to make sure I was going to be okay. And then my mom drove me. I didn't. They, they didn't let me go by myself. My mom went with me and drove me to the gas station. So if I had a problem, you know, I wouldn't be driving. <laughs> because with my history of uh, neurological problems and stuff, and sometimes a bee sting can induce a seizure, so which I didn't have any problems like that. Um, but we didn't want to take any chances of me driving and having a problem. So <laughs> she drove me to the gas station and everything, and 
But yeah, I'm I'm fine at night. Um, the but and Orkin should be out here in a couple of weeks to come spray everything and get rid of them. And my mom used up like three cans of Raid today, and she's like, they are just all over the place. You kill one of them, and five more would show up. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, but um, I'm fine. It's better and stuff. So you know, God took care of me. <laughs> I'm I'm thankful for that. Well, um, this week uh, we're going to be studying about that Jesus is the Passover and uh, Passover Lamb, and uh, we'll go ahead and get into the le- lesson after we sing our song today. And the song that we'll be singing today is um, "When I See the Blood, I Will Pass Over You." And so I'll go ahead and bring that up now. My story.
Okay, and uh, so the lesson today is going to be that Jesus is the Passover lamb. And um, so we'll go ahead and pray before we get started. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day and for your blessings and everything you've done for us. Help us to read your word and learn something from, from it. Thank you for keeping us safe and uh, helping me today with my uh, running with the bees and wasps. And uh, pray that you'll help us to read your word and learn it. In Christ Jesus' name, amen. Okay, and so first we'll look at what Passover is, and we'll go to Exodus one through I mean, Exodus twelve one through fourteen, and okay, and it says, and the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months; it shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month. They shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. Speak ye unto all the congregational... Oh, wait a minute, I read that. Uh, okay, a lamb for an house. And then in 4 it says, And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it, according to the number of the souls. Every man, according to his eating, shall make you... Your account for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. And ye shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh, and that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs, they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodded at all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs, and with the pertinence thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning, ye shall burn with fire. And thus shall ye eat it, with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste, it is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment, I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and you shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. So, this was the original Passover, the original institution of the Passover. Israel was slaves in Egypt for 400 years. God sent Moses to deliver them. Pharaoh kept saying, okay, I'll let him go. And then he would change his mind. And then God would send another plague. And it kept going that way. And God said, well, I've done had enough of it. I'm going to kill all the firstborn of Egypt, including Pharaoh's son, the heir to his throne. When that happened... Uh, and so after that happened, Pharaoh did let them go, and then he tried to chase after them, and then God overthrew them in the Red Sea, and they all drowned. Um, but Passover was so that when God passed over Egypt, when the death angel passed over Egypt to kill all the firstborn, then anyone who had the blood of the lamb on their doorposts, the, the angel of death would pass over, and no one there would die. Um, and... So, that's what it was. They had to kill a lamb and put the door, blood on the doorpost, and they had to eat the lamb that night with unleavened bread and uh, bitter herbs. And um, and so that, uh, and if they did that, then the, they would live. No one in that house would die that night. And so, that is the original story of Passover. Now, just like... Um, you know, they had to kill a lamb, put the lamb, blood lamb on the door for God to pass over them so they would not die physically. Now, Jesus is the Lamb of God, and he died at Passover at the same moment that the high priest killed the main Passover lamb. He was called the Lamb of God by John, which taketh away the sins of the world, John the Baptist. Um, and so we'll go look at all of that and see that Jesus is our Passover lamb, and now when God the Father sees the blood of Jesus on us, he passes over us, and we are not 
physically, I mean, we're not spiritually destroyed and killed. We don't suffer the spiritual death of burning forever in the lake of fire. Okay? And so we'll go look at all that. And uh, first, you know, Jesus is the Lamb of God. John one twenty nine says, The next day, John, meaning John the Baptist, uh, seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And even in Isaiah 53, it says that Jesus was led as a lamb to the slaughter, meaning he didn't fight, he didn't defend himself. And if you look at the trial of Jesus, it's very interesting, he never defended himself. Even to the point where Pilate was like, you don't have anything to say? You're, you're not defending yourself? Don't you know that I have power to set you free or to execute you or to, you know, kill you? And she was like, well, you don't have any power at all except to be giving you from above. And then Pilate got even more scared and, you know, Pilate wanted to let him go, but the religious leaders, you know, wanted him dead and Pilate gave in to mob rule and uh, peer pressure and, cruci- and let them crucify Jesus. Um... So, you know, Jesus was led as a lamb to the slaughter. He didn't protest. He didn't defend himself. If Jesus had defended himself, he would have won. Because the trial was so illegal and there was no... The witnesses couldn't agree together. If he had defended himself, he would have won. That's why he didn't defend himself. Uh, Because he knew it was the Father's will for him to die and save us uh, from our sins and from hell. And... um. So Jesus is the Lamb of God, and he was perfect and unblemished. He had no sin, just like a lamb when they had to sacrifice a lamb. It had to be perfect and no blemish in it. Physically, well, Jesus is, you know, was had no blemish, uh, either physically or spiritually, because any kind of physical blemish is caused by the physical results of the sin nature. So Jesus had no blemish in him, even physically. That's where the Bible prophesied in the book of Psalms that even if he was to dash his foot against a stone, the angels would protect him because he could have no physical or spiritual blemish because he was the Lamb of God. He was to be a sacrifice. Um, the only physical blemishes Jesus ever received was during his trial, crucifixion, the beatings. That's the only time he was ever physically harmed in any way. Um, that's why when the devil even tempted him, he said, well, you know, the the Bible says, you know, God said, the scriptures say that if you uh, dash your foot against stone, the angels will protect you. So God's going to protect you no matter what. The Father, the Father's going to protect you no matter what. So you uh, prove that you're so prove you're, that you're God and jump off the pinnacle of the temple and and let the angels catch you. And Jesus was like, uh, "It's also written not to tempt God." You know, so you know you have to be careful with your faith that it doesn't lead into tempting God. We trust him, but we don't want to tempt him either. Um, so we have to be watchful of that when we, when it comes to our faith. Um, and, uh, you know, and so Jesus is the perfect Lamb of God. He was without blemish, both physically and spiritually. He never sinned. Um, and so he was a perfect Lamb of God. And Jesus did die at Passover, and he actually died at the same moment that the high priest killed the main Passover lamb. And uh, we can see in John nineteen twenty through 42 that Jesus did die at Passover. Um, and so it says, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now, there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was a high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and broke the legs of the first and of the other, which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they broke not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith true, that ye might believe. For these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled, a bone of him shall not be broken." And again, another scripture saith, They shall look on him whom they pierced. 
And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him leave. He came therefore and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night, and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. Then took they the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with the spices, as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new sepulcher, wherein was never man yet laid. There laid they Jesus, therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day, for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. And uh, so Jesus died. It says here that, uh, you know, the high Sabbath was coming. It was the preparation of the Passover. And a lot of people get confused about this, about the timeline of when Jesus actually died. Uh, because you also have over here in Matthew 26, 17 to 21, it says, this is bef- this was uh, before Je- right before Jesus died. It says, Now the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to such a man, and say unto him, The master says, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them, and they made ready the Passover. Now when the evening was come, he sat down with the twelve. And uh, as they did eat, he said, Verily I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. Then it goes into the whole Last Supper and how Judas betrayed him. Peter denied him. He was arrested. And it goes on to the crucifixion. Now a lot of people get confused because here it says that he ate the Passover with his disciples the night before he was crucified. And then he was crucified the next day in the afternoon. Okay, you have to remember the Jewish days go from night, from eating, from Evening to evening. So this is why he was able to eat the Passover. But then also be killed on the Passover the next day in the afternoon. Because he ate the Passover with his disciples at even. And then which was the next day. And then that next day he. And then it also said it was the preparation. And um, now. um, And also the first day of. Uh, so this was the evening, it's because it, the, the, it was the first day of Unleavened Bread, and then evening comes before morning in Jewish calendar. So at evening, it was the first day after the first day of Unleavened Bread was um, was actually the actual Passover, I think. Let's see, and um, it says... Uh, that the first day of unleavened bread there in Matthew uh, does not refer to the first day of the f- seven day feast of unleavened bread on Easton, uh fifteen to twenty one, which is the, which is the actual start of the Passover in the Jewish calendar, or to Passover on Nisan fourteenth. Uh, Rather, uh, the first day was the day before the eight day celebration before Passover and the seven day feast. When Jesus removed, when the Jews removed all unleavened bread, so the first day of unleavened bread was actually the day that they actually removed all the unleavened bread from their houses, um, and then they they would eat unleavened bread that night, and that went into like the next day, which was um, the start of the Passover and the feast of unleavened bread, um, and then. Um, so they would remove all the unleavened bread and on Nisan 13th in the Jewish calendar before the pay of day of Passover on Nisan 14th, which Nisan 14th would have started on that night. So it was the daytime and it was the first day of unleavened bread. That night was Passover on Nisan 14th. Um, and then there was like a high set because it said it was a preparation of the Sabbath. Not preparation of the Passover. That Friday was a high Sabbath. Um, and then Saturday was a regular Sabbath. And um, and also, uh, this is why it's important to look up the historical context and exactly how the Passover and, st- and people did the Passover and the customs at that time. Um, the... Uh, 
Josephus, which his book is not scriptural, but it's a good historical reference of how their customs were, and it helps us to understand this better. Um, so Josephus in the Jewish wars tell us that the Jews had two different ways that they observed the Passover in Jesus' time. Most people observed the Passover in their homes on Wednesday evening as the Jewish day of Nisan begins. So that'd be Wednesday night. So Wednesday day, we started Tuesday night at sundown, was the first day of unleavened bread. Well, the disciples went and said, well, what do you want us to prepare you the Passover? Because they had to prepare it by sundown that night, which was the beginning of Nisan 14, which was the actual Passover day. And so he, so most Jews, instead of waiting on until they, they, most Jews would eat the Passover at at the beginning of Passover, there at the on Wednesday. Um, but the priests they celebrate Passover by sacrificing the Corban Pesach in the temple on Thursday afternoon as Nisan fourteen ended. So the the rest, the common people would celebrate Passover at the beginning of Passover. When uh, at the even of uh, on that Wednesday night that year, and then the uh, the priests and the uh, Pharisees, um, the religious leaders, they would actually celebrate it as Nisan was ending, as Passover was ending towards the end, uh, you know, in the afternoon towards the ending of Passover and into the beginning of the the fifteenth. Um, so that's why Jesus was able to eat the Passover because they went ahead and kept the Passover on the Wednesday night at even, which was the beginning of Passover. He ate the Passover then and then was killed the next day in the afternoon at the exact moment that the high priest killed the main Passover lamb at the temple. He, he, when he said it is finished and he gave up the ghost, it was at that moment that the high priest killed the Passover lamb and immediately the veil of the temple was rent from top to bottom and the Ark of the Covenant, well, well it wasn't there, actually. Um, <laughs> it, it's been missing since um, the, uh, the, since Babylon, the, since the Babylonian invasion, which, you know, different people say is in different places. I'm not sure. Um, I think there's been replicas made. I did hear uh, a story that makes the most sense that they, that the reason why there's one in Ethiopia is because Solomon had a replica made and gave it to his son that was an Ethiopian by the Queen of Sheba, and he actually gave it to his son. And they had, and then I I heard well that was that the actually the real one went to Ethiopia and the replica stayed in Israel. There's all kinds of different stories and stuff, but there's like thousands of year history of it being in Ethiopia and thousands of year history of it being in Jerusalem. And the fact that there's two of them kind of makes sense to me. Um, you know, a lot of people say, well, the real Ark of the Covenant is under the, uh, is in Jerusalem, buried in a tunnel. That could be. Um, but the Bible also prophesies in the Old Testament in a place where they will never, they won't you know, seek to the ark. It, it's not going to be a big deal because um, they're not going to seek to it anymore because Jesus already came and fulfilled everything. So we don't need the ark of the covenant. Um, but, you know, that veil of the temple was rent from top to bottom and the holy of holies was opened up at, at the moment that that Passover lamb was killed, at the moment that Jesus Christ himself died and became our Passover lamb, the veil of the temple was rent from top to bottom, opening up the Holy of Holies. Well, before only the high priest could enter in, he could only enter in one time a year. And if he made any kind of mistake, God would strike him dead. And that's why he had a rope tied around his ankle, and he had a bell on a pomegranate at the end of his garment, and he had to continually keep moving his feet because he, if he stopped moving, they would grab a hold of that rope and they would pull his out his dead body because that means he did something wrong and God struck him dead. It was a very dangerous job sometimes to be high priest at that time. Um, and, uh, I mean, it's still, you know, the high priest is supposed to be the perfect picture of Christ in 
uh, you know, two people in the world. He's not, he's not like the Pope claims to be where he's got his Viker on earth or anything. He's got like all power and everything. But he is supposed to be like the perfect example of Christ. And he's supposed to teach the people the ways of God. And he's supposed to live a very upright and holy life. And, um, you know, and so sinning and, and doing something uh, wrong, although today, you know, uh, it's not, there's not sacrifices and stuff. So when the temple was rebuilt, you know, we don't have to do all that. Um, we don't have all those physical limitations, but there's still a lot of spiritual things. I mean, if I was to just go out and like rebel against God and do something evil, you know, he, he's going to strike me a good one. Um, and the, actually the book of Ezekiel prophesies that. Um, and so, you know, uh, I'm still held to an extremely high standard spiritually, but now it's just spiritually. I, I don't have to worry about making some little mistake, you know, and having to do a sacrifice once a year. I, I don't have to worry about that. Um, so it has gotten easier in that sense. Um, and, but you know, the high priest would go in there w once a year and put the blood on the altar and have to go through all that. And that's why that veil was rent because it was showing that we didn't have to go through a human high priest anymore to get to God. Jesus became our high priest to get to God. And we have the Holy Spirit and we, we go to the Father through Jesus. And, and of course, Jesus is God, but we get to the Father through Jesus. We don't have to go through a human priest and do a sacrifice. Jesus is the Passover lamb. He is the final atonement. He is the final sacrifice for sin. And we have direct access to God through Jesus Christ. We don't have to. God is no longer hidden in uh, behind a veil and in mysteries. The mysteries have been opened to us. Uh, uh, Paul speaks of the mysteries of God being um, revealed to us in these last times. And so we have access to all of that. We have access to God through Jesus Christ. And we don't have to go through a human priest. Today, you know, I am the final high priest of Israel, the end times high priest of Israel, Jesus will come back in my lifetime. My job is simply to teach the people God's ways. Teach the people the difference between the profane and the holy and teach them to live holy and pure lives. I don't do blood sacrifices. I don't have to worry about God striking me dead because I make some little physical mistake. You know, um... I have to live a pure and holy life. If I intentionally rebel, you know, then, then I'm going to be in a lot of trouble. Um, and Ezekiel 16 prophesies that. And um, so, you know, I, I am held to a very high standard, but it's on a spiritual level, not a physical level. Um, but, you know, when Jesus died, he died at the same moment as that Passover lamb. The veil of the temple was rent. Opening up the Holy of Holies, showing that everyone has direct access to God through Jesus Christ. And we no longer have to keep all those rituals and customs. And we don't have to live in fear of God anymore. You know, God loves us. And we don't have to live in fear that he's going to strike us dead because of a simple physical mistake. Um, you know, he looks at the heart now. You know, and Jesus is our judge. And we have... A safety there because you know God the Father is still very strict and holy and everything and, and so since Jesus died for us he's given all judgment to Jesus and Jesus is more merciful and he uh he works with us more because he came Jesus is God and he came and lived among us and he uh understands us better you know um things did change a lot between the in the Old Testament God was a lot more stricter and harsher and you know, you someone reached out their hand to try to protect the Ark of the Covenant from falling, and God struck them dead. It was like, boy, that's... Man, you know. When God said, don't touch something, he may don't touch something. <laughs> you know. Uh, it, it's not that way in the New Testament. You know. When God's not going to strike us dead for a, for a physical mistake. You know, Jesus, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin, and, and he... It takes care of that, and um, and he looks at the heart, and we're judged on our heart and our intentions and stuff, and we make mistakes, but he has mercy and forgives us. It's, you know, God did change in some, and how he deals with us. You know, it says God never changes, but it doesn't change towards 
Like, sin is still sin. Rebellion is still rebellion. Judgment is still judgment. He is still going to judge people harshly for willful sin. But, you know, when the guy reached out to try to protect the Ark of the Covenant, his intentions were good, but God struck him dead. Uh, God's not like that anymore. He now looks at the heart. At that time, he didn't look at the heart. He was like strict obedience. You do what God says, he's going to strike you dead. That's how it was in the Old Testament. New Testament, that has changed because Jesus lived among us and he understands us and, and he has more mercy on us. Because he was tempted in every way. He understands our temptations. He was tempted in every way such as we were, we are, but yet without sin, he didn't fall. But he understands us. Um, now, that's not an excuse for willful sin. If you, you know, you just be, be rebellious and just try to get away with stuff and just go sin and don't care about what God says, it says you're still going to be judged very harshly for that. Um, but God does have, like, more patience and stuff and will give you more chances to try to repent and to try to get you to repent and stuff, too. Um, but, uh, you know, since Jesus came, we have a lot more mercy. Um and grace. And then, um, so, uh, but the Passover, you know, Jesus died on Passover and he fulfilled the law on the final sacrifice and everything. And, um, now I want to make the point that Jesus actually died on Thursday, not on Friday, because the Bible says that he was in the tomb for three days and three nights. Okay, if you put that Jesus died, it says that he, and it says he arose on the third morning. So let's count the days and nights. If he died on Friday, then he would have been on the, in the grave on Friday night, Saturday morning, Saturday night, Sunday morning. He would have arose on the second morning. If you put it back on Thursday night, if you go back into history, when the Passover and everything was, like I just explained, Passover that year was on the, uh, was on the 14th, was on Thursday. So Jesus died on Thursday afternoon, and he was buried before sundown and, and everything. And uh, so they were able to get cleaned up and everything and be pure for the Sabbath. Um, and he actually died on Thursday afternoon. If you take it that way, if he died on Thursday afternoon, they got him into the tomb and everything before sundown and... Joseph on the sea, and then was able to get themselves purified. And well, actually, if you touch the dead, I think they had to do the second Passover that you. They may have been unclean on the Passover, um, because I think if you touch the dead body, you was unclean for seven days, and you had to go through a ritual, which that was still all in place. It hadn't actually been changed yet. Jesus hadn't arose yet, so they were still. It was beginning to change, but it was, it was like on the eve of the law changing. Um, and so, uh, they probably had to, like, do the next Passover if they hadn't already done it the night before. Um, and, uh, because God did give license for that in, I think it's in the book of Exodus. There was some men who had been defiled by a dead body. They had to go bury someone. And they went to Moses and said, we can't keep the Passover. We're going to be unclean for seven days. We had to go bury a man. What do we do? So Moses went to God and asked him. God said, well, okay, if you're unclean and can't keep the Passover on uh, the 14th, uh, when you're supposed to, then keep it on the 14th day of the next month. So there was an allowance, though, for that. Um, and uh, so that's probably what they had to do when they buried Jesus. Um, but, uh, you know, so Jesus died on Thursday afternoon. So he would have been in the tomb Thursday night, Friday morning, Saturday night, Saturday morning. Wait a minute, Saturday night, wait a minute, let me think. Okay, you would have had Thursday night and Friday morning, and then you would have had Friday night and Saturday morning. Then you would have had Saturday night, and he arose on the third morning, Sunday morning. Three days, three nights. Thursday makes sense. The math comes out right. And it also matches history of when Passover was that year. Um, so, you know, uh, now the there was uh, some special Sabbaths that year. Um, 
The week that Jesus died had two different Sabbaths, including a special high Sabbath on Friday. Okay, so see, he was buried on Thursday. They had him in the grave and everything before sundown because they didn't want, and that's why they broke the legs of the other ones. They didn't want the bodies to stay on, they didn't want them to stay on the cross, says, on the Sabbath. Uh, you know, and so Friday was a high Sabbath that year. Um, and uh, the Leviticus 23 says that the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread was a special high Sabbath on Nisan 15, the day after Passover, regardless of the day of the week that it fell on. So any day could be a high Sabbath. It, the Nisan 15 was a high Sabbath, and it could be any day in that year it fell on Friday. Uh, so both Friday and Saturday were Sabbaths, the week that Jesus was crucified. The first uh, special Sabbath on the week that Jesus died started the evening right after Jesus was hastily buried in the garden tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, which would be Thursday evening in modern calendars, or the beginning of Nisan 15 in Jewish calendars, which would be a Jewish Friday. And then John 19.31 describes the special Sabbath that took place on Friday after Jesus was buried. Now, Jesus was buried before both special Sabbaths. Uh, Jewish authorities wanted Jesus tried, killed, and buried before this special high Sabbath mentioned in John 14.31 uh, and 42, and also Matthew 26.62. Luke 23.54 and Mark 15.42 puts Jesus' burial on the day of preparation, or also called Sabbath Eve, uh, which would be Thursday afternoon in all calendars before the special Friday Sabbath that began at dusk or even on Thursday evening uh, in our regular calendars today. Um, now, Jesus arose right after both Sabbaths. Uh, Jewish, and it says here, uh, women discovered the empty tomb on Sunday around dawn after the second Sabbath ended. The second Sabbath was Saturday. He arose Sunday morning around dawn. Uh, the Sabbath um, was Saturday night and day, uh, which equated to Nisan 16 in the Jewish calendar. Uh, Matthew 28, 1 uses the plural Sabbath to make it clear that the special Friday Sabbath and normal Saturday Sabbath had transpired during three nights between Jesus' death on Thursday afternoon and resurrection on Sunday morning. Um, and uh, then Jesus actually arose on first fruits. Uh, the Sadducees, who controlled the temple in Jesus' day, celebrated the feast of the first fruits on Sunday after the normal weekly Saturday Sabbath during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So Jesus rose on the first day of first fruits, and Paul explains the theological significance in 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, Jesus was the first of many more resurrections to come. He was the first fruits of the God. He was the first fruits of resurrection because now that Jesus has arose from the dead, when we die, you know, our bodies are put in the ground for a while, but then when Jesus Christ comes back, we will be resurrected. So he was the first resurrection. Um, and we will be, you know, yeah, he did raise people from the dead and stuff, but it was talking about, um, the first resurrection, like, to where, um, I guess it's like the first resurrection to where you are risen to never die again. Because anyone else who has ever risen from the dead in the Bible, like Lazarus, um, and the man in the Old Testament that touched your light, where they threw his dead body, into Elisha's grave and, and it touched Elisha's bones and he rose from the dead. Anyone rose from the dead, you know, throughout the Bible and anyone rose from the dead today, like I've been raised from the dead, you know, they end up dying again. Well, I'm not, you know, I'm going to live till the rapture, but, uh, you know, a lot of people, most people that God raises from the dead, they end up dying again. You go, they're not raised to eternal life. They're raised back to just regular life, and they end up dying again. You know, they don't have physical, they don't have, like, um, glorified bodies that can't die, that can't get sick. They still have a sin nature, unfortunately. <laughs> um, yeah, I still have a sin nature. I didn't lose that when Jesus rose me from the dead. You know, I just got this life back. I didn't get, you know, a spiritual, a new, I didn't get my new body and stuff. I still get sick. I get stung by bees and... <laughs> Uh, I have pain, and um, 
you know, it's, it's, it's still physical, regular life. Um, and that's the difference because when Jesus rose from the dead, he raised to never die again. He can't die now. He's got a glorified body. He's got a different kind of, it's a flesh and bone body. It's physical, but it's also like, it's incorrect. You know, he can't die again. It's, um, and he can go through walls and it's different. It's, it's kind of a spiritual, it is a spiritual body because the Bible does say that we are raised a spiritual body, but yet it is flesh and blood too. It's not just in spirit form. Like a heresy that goes around people teaching that Jesus just rose in spirit form. Jesus himself said after he arose, he told the disciples to touch him because he said the spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. It is still a flesh and bone body. It's not just spirit form, but it's a, it is a spiritual body in that it can never die. It can disappear and reappear. It can travel through time very quick. It can like travel very quickly. It can go through walls. Um, so it's different. Um, Jesus was the first one to ever rise like that. And when we rise on to, in the regular resurrection, uh, well, uh, or when Jesus comes back and we're changed, uh, we will then receive that same kind of body to where we will never be able to get sick, never be able to die. We will never have a sin nature again. We will be able to walk through walls and, you know, disappear and reappear and fly and, you know, travel very quickly at high speeds. You know, we'll be able to do all that stuff. Um... Jesus was the first fruits because he was the first one to rise with that kind of a body. And then later when Jesus comes back and people rise from the dead or and those of us who are still alive, when our bodies are changed, we will get a body like that. So that's why he was he rose on first fruits and he's uh, called the first fruits uh, unto God. Um, and... Uh, so, uh, you know, Jesus is the Passover lamb. He was, he died at the same moment that they killed the Passover at the temple that year. And he died on a Thursday, not on a Friday, because that's the only way you get the three days and three nights. He ate the Passover at the beginning of Passover on Wednesday night at sundown. Whereas the priests would kill the Passover uh, on the afternoon of Passover and actually celebrate it. Um, at the end of the Passover, uh, on Thursday. And so that's why, you know, Jesus ate the Passover the night before and then was killed on Passover at the same time that the priest killed the Passover lamb that year in the temple. Um, and so that, hopefully that clears up some confusion on the timeline there that some people, a lot of people struggle with. And I didn't, I had trouble understanding it completely. So I did the research and found out the history and stuff. Um, and then, um, you know, the blood of Jesus now protects us from spiritual death and the lake of fire. Just like in uh, the Old Testament in Exodus, you know, they put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. And when the death angel passed over and he saw the blood, then he wouldn't kill anybody in that household. The firstborn would live. Anyone who didn't put the blood on the door, their firstborn would die. And a lot of Egyptians died that night, including Pharaoh's son, who was to be his heir. Um, and uh, now the blood of Jesus protects us from spiritual death in the lake of fire. And we've got a few verses here. Uh, Hebrews 10, 1 through 23. I love the book of Hebrews because it fully explains. It puts the New Testament and Old Testament together. And you see how Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament. Um, and uh, Hebrews 10, 1 through 23 says, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come, 
In the volume of the book, it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above, when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin, thou wouldest not, neither has pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he might may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected for ever them that are sanctified. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where a mission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from all evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. So this goes through and says, you know, the law was a sh shadow of things to come. It was a picture. All the animal sacrifices, those animal sacrifices did not take away sins. They couldn't make, make us perfect. They couldn't make us perfect in the eyes of God. They could not take away our sins. It was, that was a picture that Jesus was coming to be the perfect line of God, which would forever take away our sins. Now, when we come to Jesus and we come to him in a true heart and full assurance of faith, and we give, commit our lives to him and we believe in him, he washes away our sins forever. The Holy Spirit comes in and that's how he puts his laws into our hearts and in our minds. And we would never turn away from him again because in the Old Testament it says that he would, when he says that he would write his laws into our hearts and minds, he says that we would never turn away from him and go to strange gods again. Okay, that right there is another proof that when a person is truly saved, they cannot do certain sins like idolatry and totally turning away from God and worshiping false gods like Israel did over and over and over again in the Old Testament. They would turn to God, then they would turn away from God and start worshiping false gods. God said that once Jesus came and died for us, and he would put... He would not, uh, you know, he would take away our sins forever. There would be no remembrance for our sins, of our sins. And he would write his laws into our hearts and we would never turn away from him again like that. And that's the Holy Spirit. That, that's how he does that. The Holy Spirit comes in and takes care of that. Um, and now, you know, we go through God, through Jesus Christ. Jesus, you know, the veil of the temple was rent because now the veil to get to, the Father is through Jesus Christ, and, and the veil is his flesh. Um, you know, we're saved by his blood, and Jesus is our mediator. We go through Jesus to get to God. We don't have to, you know, everyone can have direct access to God. It's not just the high priest. Uh, we don't have to take, we don't have to sacrifice lambs anymore. Um, everyone's on equal footing with God when it comes to access to the Father. Um, and uh, then you've got um, that God would never remember our sins anymore. And there would be no more offerings for sin. It was a one-time sacrifice of Jesus. We don't do any more sacrifices. Because it, and I noticed uh, some years ago, because when God told me I was high priest of Israel, I'm trying, I was trying to figure out, well, this is the New Testament. Um, what do I, what's my job? You know, and for a while I thought that, because it was like talking about um, different sacrifices and stuff in the Old Testament prophecies. 
about morning evening oblation would still be going on and stuff. And so I was looking at that. And, to, and I thought for a while that, well, we wouldn't do sacrifices for sin, but some of the other ones would still be. But then I found this in Hebrews where it said that he was not pleased with any kind of sacrifice. Whether it was sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin. So there was not any sacrifice. And I'm like, well, if God's not pleased with any sacrifice, why would we do it? I started praying and asking God, why is it prophesied in Ezekiel? That we would do sacrifices. We're not going to do sacrifices. And God said well. And then I found out that the Ezekiel temple. Was actually supposed to be built. During the days of Zerubbabel. But they ended up building a different temple. Because Israel was backslidden. I mean go read the book of Ezra. Then people were. You had. They they were like not right with God. And Ezra had to go in there and clean house. And God said, and so God didn't allow them to build the Ezekiel temple. They built a different temple. And God said that, you know, prophecies shall fail. The New Testament says the prophecies shall fail, both biblical and other. And God said that prophecy failed. That would, those sacrifices would have been in the days of Israel before Jesus Christ came. Jesus Christ came. You don't do any sacrifices. And he showed me the book of Hebrews. And I went, oh, okay. So then I'm searching the scriptures trying to find out, well, you said I'm high priest of Israel. What am I supposed to do? He says, well, uh, you know, the high priest of Israel, they made sure that the whole tribe of Levi got all their pay. They managed the temple and took care of everything. They managed the tithes because people would still bring, like, tithes of first fruits and money and stuff. Uh, there just wouldn't be any animal sacrifice, but they would still, like, bring tithes of their animals because that's a type of income. So they'll still got to be like a manager. Um, and then also I read, well, the priests are supposed to teach the people, the difference between the profane and the holy. They're supposed to teach the people the ways of God. They're supposed to teach people the law. And God said, that's what you do. You're managing the tithes and offerings. You're managing the pay of the tribe of Israel. You're managing all that stuff. Um, you're also, you would also teach the people the ways of God and, and truth. Um, and... In the Old Testament, in, in in ancient Israel, when all of that was around, the school system was not ran by the government. It was ran by the temple. So God said that when I get, when people allow me to have my position, that I will redo the school system in Israel and the school system will no longer be on the government. It will come under the temple and I will be the top administrator over the school system because the school system was ran by the temple, the synagogues, the Levitical tribe, um, and other people were teaching stuff too, but it was like, that was one of the main teach, the main jobs of the priests and Levites was to teach. And that has not changed. Um, you know, I grew up being homeschooled and we always had a bumper sticker on our car and it was a big thing. Mary and Joseph homeschooled. I grew up believing, and I don't know where they got that at because it's not in the Bible. The Bible doesn't say where Jesus went to school at. So I grew up believing that Mary and Joseph homeschooled and Jesus was homeschooled. Well, I have since learned that um, Jewish history shows that Mary and Joseph did not homeschool. Every, the children were not homeschooled. They went to the local synagogue and a priest or a Levite or a ruler of that synagogue would take all the little children and they would have school. And he would teach them, first of all, how to read. And he would teach them how to read by using scripture. And he taught them and he had them memorize a lot of scripture. And he taught them to read using scripture. He would also teach them mathematics and science. He was a school teacher. Girls went and got an education up to 10 years old. And then they went home and learned from their mothers how to keep house and everything. The boys went to 12 years old because they, and those extra two years, were mostly preparing them for their bar mitzvah, where they would then have equal um, right in the synagogue to speak and teach uh, in the synagogue. So they had two years of kind of like a, of, of intense Bible training. Um... And then at 12 years old, they were considered uh, men in like a uh, spiritual sense because 
even the Jews throughout history have recognized 20 as the actual age of an adult. Um, 12 years old, uh, they started, um, they recognized them at 12 years old to where they can, like, speak in the temple. They would start training for their career. Um, they could get married at that time, but it was highly discouraged because they were so young, and most of them didn't. Um, and, uh, so, 12 years old was, like, the beginning of adulthood in a lot of senses, but they still believed that God didn't hold them accountable for a lot of, uh, hold them, like, really accountable for a lot of sins and stuff until they were, like, 20. Um, unless they got, now, if they got married, some of that would change because then, of course, they would be held accountable for adultery because marriage is an adult decision, an adult act. So, that's one reason why it was discouraged for them to marry. I mean, marrying at 12 years old is really young. And it was highly discouraged for them to marry that young. Um, so most of them didn't. I've never heard of anyone actually getting married at 12 years old. Uh, most of most of the time, the women would marry about 15, and the men would be in their 20s. So you'd have a man in his 20s marrying a 15-year-old woman. That's usually what happened. Um, and uh, the women... So the women... The girls received the exact same education as the boys up to 10 years old. Uh, you know, they learned how to read, they learned how to write, they learned, uh, finance and, you know, mathematics, um, they learned science, they received the exact same education, which was really different at that time, because so many cultures, the women didn't even learn how to read or write, you know, women just stayed in the home and they didn't, they didn't learn anything, except for cooking and cleaning and stuff, so the Jews have always been very... It's always been very important for them, for both the boys and girls, to learn how to read, learn how to write, learn how to, you know, do mathematics and learn science. Um, that's always been a big thing. Uh, the boys simply went to two years of more schooling for in-depth Bible training was the difference on that. Um, and uh, so the law, you know, at that time, they would... Uh, the book of Hebrews here goes through the law and, uh, they, you know, they were considered, um, the men were considered adults at, uh, 12 years old in a lot of ways. And, but the school system at that time, the job of the priest is part of that job was the school system. And so today, um, you know, if and when Israel ever allows me to fulfill my calling, of being the high priest of Israel, because it's up to them for me to fully, I mean, I fulfill it, you know, I teach and I try to teach people the ways of God and stuff and the truth, and that's a, my a main part of it, but for me to actually be able to, like, do more, um, they have to be willing to give me my position. Um, unfortunately, they have a history of going against God's will, and they're still doing that. Um, and, you know, it takes them a while to and usually God has to whack them pretty good before they finally submit and go, oh, okay, that's what God actually wants, so we'll obey. Um, I pray every day that they will reach that, and God won't have to judge them so harshly. And, you know, my brother and I can go over there and help them, and we can make Israel the head of the nations instead of the tail, and we can, you know, bring them peace and prosperity like the Bible promises. Um, the Bible promises that for Israel and for the rest of the world. Because if Israel is right with God and Israel, if everything is going good with Israel, the rest of the world will benefit. The, the Bible shows that. You know, if Israel is at peace, then there's, there's a lot more chance that the rest of the world will be at peace and the rest of the world shows in those blessings. So if we want world peace, well, Israel needs to, um, you know, do what God wants them to do and put us in all positions, you know. Um... And we pray for that every day. And, you know, so once, you know, since the Levitical tribe and the priesthood did run the schools, uh, that's what God wants again. Um, and so that's what we will do uh, when we, if and when we <laughs> go over there. Um, and uh, so, you know, as I found out I was high priest, and I'm looking at, like, the different feast days and the different, you know, how do we keep this stuff? What do we do? And trying to figure all this out, you know, we don't have sacrifices anymore. We, we can keep the Passover, but it's not the same. It's not like a, it's not a sacrifice. It's just a feast. 
Um, it's not the same thing. It, it changed. The law changed. There was a change in the law. And, you know, you can keep the Jewish feast days if you want to, but you don't have to. Um, Paul said that very strongly in uh, his writings, that you don't have to keep those feast days. Um, and uh, But we can, and, um, you know, we'll keep the Passover and stuff, but it's not going to be like a sacrifice. It'll be just a... Uh, celebration because and and of course we will integrate into it that Jesus is the Passover lamb he has come it is fulfilled you know all the Jewish holidays have been fulfilled Jesus is everything Jesus is Passover lamb Jesus is first fruits Jesus is the atonement Jesus tabernacled among us because he became human um you know the feast of trumpets well that one hasn't quite been fulfilled yet that's when he comes back um, feast trumpets will be fulfilled when you, because the trumpets will sound and he'll come back. So that's, and a lot of people believe that Jesus will actually come back on the feast of trumpets. Um, the Bible says we won't know the day or the hour, but the feast of trumpets, there's a hint there because the feast of trumpets is actually celebrated on two different days because no one knows when the feast of trumpets actually is. It's either on one day or the other. And my brother has studied that out and he understands it. And my brother, uh, thinks that, well, it says we don't know the day of the hour, he thinks, he believes, well, it will be on the Feast of Trumpets, but we don't know exactly what day the Feast of Trumpets is on, so we don't know the day of the hour. But we know the time. Jesus said we would know the time. Um, so, that's, you know, and I kind of agree with that because it, it does make sense. Um, so, you know, Jesus has fulfilled everything, and he's fulfilled Passover. He is the Passover lamb, and uh, now, also in Romans 6.23, it says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And in Revelation 20.14 says that death and hell were cast into the lake of fire, and this is the second death. So just like in the Old Testament Exodus, the blood of the Lamb on the door protected them from physical death, the blood of Jesus will now protect us from spiritual death in the lake of fire. When God sees the blood of Jesus on us, he will pass over us, and we will not be thrown in the lake of fire. Okay? And um, now, Christians are commanded, actually, to keep the Passover in a spiritual sense by living pure and holy lives. That's actually found in 1 Corinthians 15. Now, the book of 1 Corinthians was written to the church at Corinth, which in the first letter, those two letters to the church of Corinth, and in the, uh, and there were two books... And in the first book, Paul is like, he is ripping them a new one. He is rebuking them. I mean, he's chewing them out because they have committed some very, very awful, serious sins. And he is rebuking them. And uh, then they end up repenting. So then in 2 Corinthians, he is consoling them and saying that he forgives them and that God has forgiven them because they've repented. Um, but... Today we're looking at First Corinthians when Paul's chewing them out because they have committed an absolutely evil sin. Uh, so for, that we understand the and it does mention about Passover in verses seven through eight, um, but we'll read the whole chapter so we can understand it better. So First Corinthians five one says it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. And such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up, and have not whether mourned, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already, as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together, and my spirit with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit might may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep this feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. 
I wrote unto you in an epistle not to keep company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must needs ye go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or a covetous, or an idolater, or a reller, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such... And one, know not to eat, meaning don't eat the Lord's Supper uh, with them. Um, For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without, God judges. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. So, this is a, was written at the time of Passover because Paul mentions Passover when he mentions unleavened bread. Um... Paul got word that the church at Corinth had a member who went and 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 was um, having a unholy relationship with his mother and with his uh, stepmother. Okay, that's just evil. And God and and God got angry and Paul got angry. And Paul lamb blasted them and rebuked them. I mean, he let them have it. Um, and, uh, you know, and it showed here that the man and the church did not kick the man out. They didn't, they didn't punish him or anything. They didn't do anything about it. Um, he was still a full member in the church and just, and they were eating the Lord's Supper with him and everything. And, and man, Paul got mad and, you know, uh, the scriptures is inspired by the Holy Ghost, so God got mad and it came through, you know, uh, through Paul's words and letter here. Um, and if you see here, this man who did this was not saved. A saved person cannot do this. And you see that here because verse 5 says, no, verse 4 says that they are to deliver the man unto Satan for the destruction of his flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Well, wait a minute. Paul was saying this man is not saved. This man is lost. He is a lost man and he has committed a wicked sin and he does not need to be in the church and you are not to eat with him and you are to kick him out of the church because he is lost and he has committed a grievous sin and you cannot condone that. Because if the man had was saved, it wouldn't say that his spirit would be saved on the day of the Lord Jesus. It was said that the spirit may be saved. He's saying, turn him over to the Satan so that Satan can destroy his flesh so that hopefully he will wake up, he will repent, and he will get saved. If his spirit may be saved in the, Lord, in the day of the Lord Jesus, his spirit wasn't saved. If his spirit's not saved, he's lost and he's on his way to hell. He's not saved. He was saying, this man has proven to be lost. This man is saved. Kick, and he has done a grievous sin. Kick him out of the church. Turn him over to Satan so that his flesh can be destroyed so that hopefully he will end up getting saved. Okay, this was not a saved man who backslid and found a sin. A saved person cannot commit this kind of adultery and fornicate this, this, this sin. A saved person can't do this. Um, so that that's one of the places where we get that. There are certain sins that a saved person can't do. This man was lost. This man was not saved. And all my life I've heard it preached that this man was a saved man. Who had backslid. No, this man was lost. Someone who was saved and backslid, well, their spirit doesn't need to be saved. Their spirit is saved. They need to repent and get right with God. But the spirit is saved and, you know, someone who's backslid and, and falls into sin, they don't fall into this bad of sin. Um, This bad, this sin was bad enough. Paul saying, this guy's not saved. And God himself was saying, this is the guy, because you have to remember, all scripture was written by God and just inspired into the apostles. They wrote what God told them the right. So God was saying here, this man does not say kick him out of the church. And um he's and you know Passover was apparently at this time and he was putting this in the Passover. He said, Your glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Purge out therefore the old leaven that ye may be a new lump as ye are unleavened. So leaven in the Bible is representation of sin. Okay, a little bit of sin Makes you a sinner. Makes you it living a little leaven, leaven the whole lump. A little bit of sin makes you a sinner. Makes you you know you're not right with God. You're you're in trouble. 
um, which will send us anyway, but a little bit of sin will get you in trouble with God. Um, and they're saying to repent, purge out there for the old leaven. That means repent of the sin, get rid of the sin, that ye may be a new lump, because, you know, you're forgiven, and then you're made new, and he's saying, you are unleavened, you have sin, and you need to get rid of it, and then he says, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us, therefore let us keep this feast, meaning the Passover feast in a spiritual sense, not with old leaven, which is sin, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, so don't live a life of sin, don't don't be a hypocrite and try to say that you're a Christian and um, then live a sinful life but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Okay? And this is an everyday occurrence, not just at Passover. Because Christ is our Passover sacrifice for us, and he is eternally a sacrificial lamb. The book of Revelation, John says that he saw a lamb as it had been slain. And that lamb was able to open the books that no man could open. That lamb is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ to this day still bears wounds. He doesn't have scars. Because in order to have scars, you have to have blood in your body. Jesus has no blood in his body. He shed all his blood. His blood, he took it in a vessel up to heaven. And he put it on the mercy seat in heaven to atone for us. He doesn't have blood. He doesn't have scars. Okay. He has open wounds. In his hands. And in his side. And in his feet. And that's why he still looks like a slain lamb. Uh, John seen him as a flame lamb. He is an eternal sacrifice. He is eternally, that's why he only had to die once. Because he eternally saves us. Um, he is the eternal sacrifice. Uh, he's, he doesn't have to be sacrificed again. He washed away all sins. He continually stands before God as a sacrificed lamb. In order to make atonement for us. His blood is continually on the mercy seat. It is still there. It's not corruptible blood. So it never decays. Only sinful blood decays. He had no sin. He had. He saw no corruption. His blood never decays. It will be there on that mercy seat forever. If it ever decayed and went away. We'd be in trouble. We wouldn't be saved no more. That can't happen. Um, so. Uh. You know, Jesus is our Passover. He has sacrificed for us. We are to keep, in one place it says that we keep the Sabbath. You know, in the Old Testament they said keep the Sabbath day holy. Well, New Testament, Jesus is the Sabbath. He is the day we keep Jesus holy. We don't have to physically keep the Passover anymore. We keep the Passover by keeping Jesus holy, by having unleavened, uh, uh, our lives of sincerity and truth and trying to please God is the unleavened bread that we are supposed to uh, show forth. Uh, that That's pictured as unleavened bread. Um, so this is how we keep Passover and we don't just do it at Passover. We do it every single day of our lives because Jesus is our eternal Savior. It's not a once a year thing. It's every single day. We make sure we purge out old sin and we repent and we ask God for forgiveness, not because we have to be saved again, but we ask God for forgiveness so that he doesn't chastise us as hard. Um, because if you just sin and just go on, I mean, even if you have a child, if, they, if your child disobeys you and you talk to them and they repent, then you're less likely to do any other punishment. And they apologize and they say, okay, I'll, I'll be good. Just from you talking to them, then you're, you're probably not going to give them any other punishment. But if you talk to them and they just don't really give any, you know, they don't say they're sorry, they don't ask you for, to forgive them, and they don't really, and they're just like, okay, you know, and that's kind of seen as being obstinate. And you're probably going to, you know, put them in the corner, ground them, maybe spank them. You're going to discipline them in, in in some other way because you're thinking, well, they didn't get it. They don't understand what they did. You know, they're not remorseful. If you don't show, if a person doesn't show remorse, they're usually going to get more punishment than if they show remorse. So we ask God to forgive us so that we let God go, hey, well, sorry, please have mercy and, and help me not to do it again. I repent. And then he's less likely to, you know, uh, chastise it because... God doesn't punish us 
He he took our punishment. God's thing is to correct us. If we get the correction through his Holy Spirit talking to us, then that's the end of it. You know, we got it. And he forgives us and, and there's no further punishment. But if we don't get it and and we're not remorseful, we're, we don't ask for forgiveness, um, then he's going to be like, well, they're not, they're not remorseful. They, you know, they'll be an obstinate and he's going to do something else to correct us. He's going to do a harsher punishment. Um, so that's why we ask God for forgiveness. It's not that we need to save, just that we want, it's like we're begging for mercy because, I mean, you know, God is still God. He can, like Jesus said, you know, fear him that can destroy both body and soul in hell. I mean, you know, he can, and, and even in this life, he can strip everything from us. He can make our lives miserable. There's still a fear there. Yes, we're supposed to fear God in that we should know that if we commit willful sin, if we rebel against God, he is going to chastise us. He is going to do something to get our attention that we're not going to like. Okay, that's the fear of God. We're not supposed to be afraid of him. To will. We're afraid that he's going to whack us upside the head just because we make a mistake. But we should fear him enough to we wouldn't do a willful sin and rebel against him. Um, and so that's the fear there. And there's also a reverence where we respect him and stuff. But there is an act, you know, I heard pretty so much, oh, we don't, we're not afraid of God, we should just reverence him. And, but, and I see the church falling more and more into sin. And it's like they don't have, and the Bible even says, it probably says that they have no fear of God in their eyes, before their eyes. There is a fear. You must feel that if you intentionally, willfully sin, God is going to chastise you. He's going to get your attention and you're not going to like it. Okay, there is a fear there. Um, but it's not to where a lot of people experience, which I've struggled with, well, you're so scared of God to like, oh man, I made a mistake and he's just going to whack me with a good one. Okay, there's a balance on that fear. Okay. Um, it's like when you're a child... And you know you shouldn't do something wrong because you're afraid you're going to get in trouble from your parents. It's the same thing. If you have good parents, you're not, like, you're probably not going to be afraid if you just do a mistake. Um, but you would be afraid if you just deliberately disobeyed them and went and did something, you know. Um, and, you know, then you'd be afraid that, you know, you're going to get in trouble. There's going to be bad consequences. You're not going to like it. Um, so that's the kind of fear we're supposed to have. Um, and so when we keep the Passover, we can keep the Passover physically if we want to. Uh, my family and I does that. Um, but the, every Christian must keep the Passover in a spiritual sense by living a life of sincerity and truth to where we are, you know, we don't have leaven, we don't have the leaven of sin in us. Um, we have unleavened, whether it's equated to unleavened bread, we serve God in sincerity and truth. We're not rebellious. We're not trying to just get away with something behind God's back like this guy was, you know. And plus it goes in the, you know, this here goes in the church discipline. If you have someone like that in your church, you're supposed to kick them out of the church. You know, and then when they repent and in Second Corinthians, the man repented and uh, Paul said, well, bring him back in the church. He has repented. Um, so when they repent, you bring him back in. Um, but, you know, Christians are supposed to keep the Passover in a spiritual sense by living a pure and holy life. And, um, you know, now down here where it says, you know, living in the world, but not of the world, you know, out in the world, dealing with lost people, you know, we're going to have to deal with people who are fornicators and covetous and extortioners and idolaters and even in our day and age, homosexuals. We're going to have to deal with those people. We're going to have to... Jesus even Jesus even said, make friends with the unrighteous man. You know, we don't become their friend to where we allow them to influence us to do something bad. But we have to befriend them in order to try to lead them to Christ. Now, we don't be like them to win them, to, uh, but we don't take part in those sin. But we can befriend them and we can show them the love of Christ. And that's about the best way to um, lead them. I mean, this thing of people claim to be Christians and they're like being hateful and towards them and stuff. Well, you know, um, homosexuality is just as bad of a sin as adultery. Okay? Um, I don't see, you know, these people who won't do the wedding cakes and stuff, I see their point, but I also see a problem. And I think 
the courts may be looking at this too. They're only refusing to do a cake for a homosexual wedding. Because, well, that's an abomination. And those people are worthy of death. Okay, but so is adultery. Have those cake makers ever, have they made sure that every couple that comes in there, that they didn't leave the first spouse to marry the second one and they're not actually committing adultery? Are they making sure of that? Are they making sure that either both people are saved or both people are lost? Are they making sure that it's not a saved person marrying a lost person, which is also an abomination in the eyes of God? Or are they just being are they just picking out the parts of the Bible that they want to obey and ignoring the rest of it? Okay? That's a good question. I don't know. I mean, I've never heard of anyone refusing to make a wedding cake for someone who left one spouse to and they're actually like doing adultery. The marriage is adulterous. I've never heard of that. I've never heard of someone Refusing to do a wedding cake because one is lost and one is saved. If you're not going to stand on the whole word of God, don't pick and choose what you stand on. And like the Bible says, you know, be, we are in the world, not of the world. We have to deal with people. It's not a sin to bake a cake for a homosexual wedding. Um... Because you're just, it, that's your business and, and you're just uh, making money. We have to, nowhere in the Bible does it say that that is a sin. It's not in there. It says that we have to deal with these people. We have to deal with fornicators. We have to deal with evil people in or, because we live in the world. If, if we didn't deal with these people, God would have to, you know, you go back to the early church. They had bakers back then too. And it was open law that... You know, that stuff was legal. It was worse then than it is now. It was just absolutely commonly accepted. It was a lot worse than ancient Rome. Go back to the early church. Go back to the days of Jesus and the apostles. It was evil. Okay? You never had anyone in the Bible refer- refuse to do a do some Like, Paul didn't say, oh, I can't sell you a tent. Where in the Bible did Paul refuse to sell a tent to a homosexual couple for their honeymoon? That's not in there. Now, I'm going to get a lot of people mad at me, and, and the Christian world is going to ostracize me and say that I have to become a liberal and a heretic. But show me scripture and verse where it says that as a business, you cannot, that you have to discriminate against those people. Christians need to start living their lives by the Bible and start loving people. You have to love the people in the world, or you're not going, you're not going to lead them to Christ. If I had a bake business, um, I would have a set because I've heard of some of them wanting like really um, bad cakes, like they like they're perverted. You know, you can have it in your policy where you will not do a cake that's pornographic because you have that right, but you can't totally say I won't do a cake for a homosexual wedding or I won't do pictures for a homosexual wedding. Um. They're coming out more and more that you can't do that. And it's not biblical to not do that. What I would do is I would, as long as the cake was not perverted, a perverted picture or something, you know, if it was just a regular wedding cake and it didn't, it wasn't like pornographic, I would make the cake and I would do the service for them um, in that, you know, do the service of making the cake and everything. But then I would try to give them a, just give them a regular gospel track and and share the love of Jesus with them and uh, not condemn them. Um, but God already condemned them; they're already condemned. And they don't need me to condemn them. They need me to show them the love of Christ and to show them the way of salvation. Because if they truly get saved, God will take that homosexual away from them. Because a truly saved person can't be a homosexual. Uh, all these people run around and he'll say that they're homosexuals and saved. No, they're not. Um, Unfortunately, they may not understand that because a lot of Baptists, you know, the way the Baptist teaches is that a, home, a, a person can be mar- a married homosexual and be saved and they're just backslid. No, they're lost and going to hell. Now, I would, there's ways that you can let these people know that they need to be saved and Jesus loves them and Jesus wants to save them and, you know, they're lost and they're going to hell and we're all sinners 
And those ways that you can share the gospel with them, they may still get the points that they, you know, some people still get offended and stuff. Um, but if you are nice to them and you show the love of Christ and you just try to plant a seed and you pray for them and you give them just a general gospel track and don't attack them, where in the Bible did, where in the Bible, you know, the apostle Paul preached on Mars Hill. He didn't stand up there and say, and, and say meanly and in mean words, you know, you guys are a bunch of heathenistic idolaters and God's going to send you to hell. No, he took, he, he tried to show the love of Jesus with them. He took some of what they believed and showed them how that, uh, and, and, and tried to show the gospel, uh, from that lens. And, you know, you go read the sermon of Paul on Mars Hill. It's a real eye opener on how to deal with these people that have different ideas. Paul loved those people and he taught them the truth and he did it out of love, not out of, he didn't attack them. He didn't hate them. He didn't dis he didn't discriminate against them. You know, and in all cultural wars and stuff, you know, I was raised very, very conservative and raised to attack people. And guns had to deal with me and change me on this. Um we don't attack people. We love people. We share the God. Yes, it is true. They are going to die and go to hell. But so is the idolater and so is the adulterer, so is the Buddhist. Okay? They're all worthy of death. Go you go read Romans chapter one. Idolater the Buddhist is worthy of death because he is an idolater and doesn't worship the true God. Um the uh Adulterer is worthy of death, even if it's a man and a woman. Yes, the homosexual is worthy of death, too. But those other people are worthy of death, and we have no problem socializing with these other people to try to lead them to Christ. But when it comes to the homosexual, we... Well, no, we can't have nothing to do with you, and we discriminate against them and show them hate and not love. Treat the homosexual the same way you treat the adulterer and the Buddhist. Treat them all the same with love, trying to lead them to Christ, lovingly trying to show them, hey, God loves you. He doesn't want you to go to hell, you know, and, and all sin is sin. We're all sinners. We've all done wrong. You tell them your testimony and, you know, you, you can use things like, you know, are you afraid to die? You know, what do you think is going to happen to you after death? There's ways you can witness to them. And yes, the gospel offends people. They may, may still get offended, but there are ways we can do it to where it's not as offensive. And hopefully we can win some of them in a in a better way. But you're not hardly going to win anybody if you scream and holler at them and and you discriminate against them. And like I said, a lot of people will get mad at me and call me a heretic and call me a liberal. But I'm not saying that they're good, that they're holy, that they're going to heaven. I'm saying we are in the world, not of the world. We have to live in this world. We have to make a living. We have to work. You know... And you're going to find Christians getting kicked out of their workplaces and everything because they they refuse to be in the world. They're trying to take themselves out of the world. Jesus himself prayed that the Father would not take us out of the world, but would protect us in it. Okay, and we must, the Bible says that we have to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. We've got to beg God for wisdom on how to handle different situations that come up to where, and it is difficult. It is a tight line. And um, we have to, but if we're trying to please God, God will gently teach us and show us. We don't want to be scared to where we don't obey God, but we don't want to do things that we don't, we, we don't want to, we want to be harmless as serpents. We don't want to drive people away from God. And we don't want to uh, put ourselves in situations that we don't have to be in. We don't want to cause trouble for ourselves that we don't have to go through. Okay. Um, you know, situations come up and stuff and you beg God for wisdom. Um, uh, you know, that's. We live in an evil world, and we have to have wisdom on how to live in this world, and the Holy Spirit will give that to you. Um, so these people, you know, were in the world, were not of the world. Uh, so, and also another thing is now, if someone claims to be a Christian, and this is written to a church, if someone claims to be a Christian, and they are into those kind of sins, 
then you kick them out of the church. You don't let them be a member of the church. You don't let them partake of the Lord's Supper. Okay? Because then you're condoning it and, and you're preaching through your actions that that's okay and that's not okay. Um, so, you know, this is to a church, um, you know, you don't keep company with someone that calls themselves a Christian, uh, you don't let them be a member of the church, you don't let them eat the Lord's Supper, you don't let them have position in the church, sing in the choir, teach a Sunday school class, they're not saved, and you kick them out of the church until they repent. Um, that's what the teaching is. That's the biblical teaching. That we're in the world, not of the world. We don't discriminate against people. We don't hate people. We don't scream and holler at people, uh, and attack people. We are to love, share the love of Christ with them, and you can do that without compromising. And God is still teaching me and my brother how to deal with situations as they come up, especially with my brother's work. Um, and, uh, so, you know, he's learning how to deal with things. Um, and, you know, they were passing out pamphlets on transgenderism, and he just said, well, no, I don't want one. And he didn't get in an argument with him and start preaching at him, hey, that's evil, and, and you people gonna go to hell. He just said, well, no, I, I, I don't want one. And he went on. He refused it. And he people at his job have asked me before what he thinks about homosexuality and stuff, and he says, well, um, I, I'm a Christian. I believe the Bible, and I believe that it is a sin, um, and, you know, uh, because it's a sin, I don't live that kind of lifestyle, but when, you know, what people do with their lives, um, that's between them and God, and God judges them, and it is a, you know, the Bible says it's a sin, and the Bible says that they need to get saved, uh, or God's going to punish them in hell, and he will tell them that, and since he is giving his, he's not being mean, and, uh, He's not being mean. He's not bringing up the thing. He just answers when they ask him because the Bible says to give a hope of the reason that is when you in you when someone asks you and you ask for. And then he's always saying, well, the Bible says, and this is what I believe. And he's not openly forcing those beliefs on others. He is just giving his opinion and he's never gotten in any trouble. Um, and the problem is that when these Christians go in there and they just start attacking people. You have to do it in the right way because this is American. You can't if you if they come and ask you your opinion and you say, "Well, this is my opinion and this is and I believe what the Bible says and this is what the Bible says," they can't do anything about that. Now they can in other countries. Some Christians lose their heads over things like that. But that's part of persecution, and it may get that bad in America, but so far it hasn't. And we just keep praying that God works a miracle and saves the nation. Um, but, you know, we're in the world. We're not over the world. We have to deal with people. But as Christians, we are supposed to keep the Passover on a daily basis by living a pure and holy life. The church is supposed to keep the Passover constantly by keeping sin out of the church. You know, the really bad open sins like this. I mean, there's a church member in a really bad open sin. Okay, they're not saved. They won't repent. You know, you kick them out of the church. You don't let them be a Sunday school teacher. You don't let them keep the Lord's Supper. That's what this is talking about here. So, you know, Jesus is our Passover lamb. He died on Passover at the same time that the uh, Passover lamb was killed that year. And um, and he arose on first fruits because he was the first one to rise from the dead into a glorified body. Um to, you know, it was, a, it was both a flesh and bone body, but also a spiritual body because it could go through walls and uh, and everything and it will never die, never get sick, no sin nature. He's the first one to, well, he didn't have a sin nature anyway, but um, he's the first one to ever rise like that. And then in the end, we all will rise or be changed into that. Um, and now, you know, just like the Passover lamb, the blood of the Passover lamb protected them from physical death in the Old Testament on the first Passover, it now fit, protects us from spiritual death, uh, in the lake of fire, um, now, uh, through Jesus, and, uh, we don't go to hell, uh, and we don't go in the lake of fire, and, um, Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, and that death there is the lake of fire, it says, uh, Revelation twenty fourteen and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Many times as Christians, we call the lake of fire hell. 
Um, but actually, the lake of fire is not hell. Hell, there is fire in hell because you have um, the story Jesus told about the rich man who was tormented in a flame in hell. So there is fire in hell. Um, but hell is not the second death. The second death is the lake of fire when both death and hell are cast into a lake of fire. Um, so it's like the lake of fire is bigger than hell. Um, and, uh, then, you know, Christians were supposed to keep the Passover by living pure and holy lives. And that does not mean that we ostracize the world and discriminate against the, against unsaved people and people who are involved in wicked sins. We have to deal with them because we are in this world, but not of this world. We have to make a living. We have to, uh, live, you know, um, but we don't, we have to pray for much wisdom to know, you know, that we don't compromise our beliefs. We don't compromise on the word of God. Um, but we don't discriminate again and hate people either. We have to love them to Jesus. We're not going to be able to lead homosexuals to Christ if we discriminate against them. That's not going to work. Would you listen to someone who discriminated against you and told you you was a bad and awful person because of something? Would you listen to anything else they had to say? Does that be a mean like that? No, we're supposed to preach the gospel in love and there's ways to do it. And, you know, uh, many times different situations call for different tactics. And we, we're learning that you just have to pray a lot. Like, you can't do anything without prayer. We are in a war. Okay, this is the end times. We're in a war. And you, the Bible says you had to put on the whole armor of God and you put it on with prayer. Prayer is number one. You're not going to make it in this world. You are going to end up getting either compromising and getting in trouble with God or you're going to end up, um, you know, getting yourself in trouble that you don't have to get yourself into by the legal stuff. If you don't pray, you've got to pray and ask for wisdom and search the scriptures and see, okay, in this situation, how do I handle this biblically? You know, and we've learned, you know, a lot of times it's just, um, uh, it's just simply speaking the truth and love saying, well, my opinion, you know, uh, you know, I believe the Bible and this is what the Bible says, but you know, uh, I, I, I still care about you. I can be your friend. And, you know, how you live your life is between you and God. Uh, you know, I can tell you what the Bible says, but I can't make you change. You know, you have to go to God and, you know, that's be, your, the way you live your life is between you and God. Um, that's how we have to deal with them in this society because it's legal. I mean, we have a wicked government and they legalized it. Okay, if we had a wicked government that legalized murder, we'd have to treat murderers the same way. Thank God they haven't, you know, well, they legalized murder through abortion and stuff, but, um, like, they haven't, like, literally, like, legalized serial killings or something, you know. Um, but it's not our job, you know, to judge people in that way. Um, we do, you know, we, we... It is a judgment in that we tell them and love that, the, you know, those sinners and they're going to go to hell. <coughs> but Jesus loves them. But, you know, we're all sinners. They're not a worse sinner because of the homosexuality. They're not worse than all of the sinners. Adultery is just as much of an abomination. Okay. Uh, theft will send a person to hell just as fast as homosexuality will. Um... It's, you know, sin is sin. Um, so, you know, we have to be in the world, but not of the world. But um, Jesus is our Passover lamb, and um, we don't have to uh, do the Passover in a physical way anymore, but we can if we want to, because the Bible says not to judge anyone concerning how they observe a feast day or if they observe a feast day, so you can keep it. In a physical sense, but you know, as Christians, we have to keep in a spiritual sense in sincerity and truth. That sincerity and truth includes loving people to Jesus. We share the truth to them, and we let them know that we truly care about them, and we also still, and we truly care, and we're worried about their soul, and we want them to get saved. And sometimes that's still going to get us in legal trouble. We may lose our jobs. That's part of persecution, you know. But we need to make sure that we are blameless in it, that we love them in a way. To where they will hopefully end up 
repenting and getting saved because, and they'll feel bad for persecuting us uh, because we were so loving to them. Um, so um, that's my sermon of the day. And um, I hope you all have a wonderful week. And may God bless you. And uh, we'll go ahead and close in prayer. And then I will do the ironic blessing over you in Hebrew and then in English as found in the Bible in Numbers 6, 24 through 26. So let's go ahead and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, thank you for this day and for your word and all your blessings. I pray that you will help us to remember your word and learn from it. And uh, thank you so much for being the Passover lamb and taking our sins away forever. And um, help us to live pure and holy lives and keep uh, the... Leaven, the leaven of sin out of our lives and help us that our lives will be unleavened and we'll have pure and holy lives and we will serve you in sincerity and truth. We will share your love with others in sincerity and truth and you'll give us wisdom in every situation on how to handle those situations in the best way. Make us wise as serpents and harmless as doves and bless us this week and help us and give us power and strength and protect us from our enemies and from persecution according to your will and um if it's your will for us to be persecuted, help us to endure and to love our enemies and to love you and stay faithful to you. And uh, thank you for all your blessings. In Christ Jesus' name, amen. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Thank you so much for watching this week. And I pray you have a very blessed week. And uh, please uh, come back next week and listen to another teaching. And um, also, uh, we do have links uh, in the description if you'd like to help support this ministry. So that we can reach more people with the truth. I try my best to share the truth as the Bible puts it and not go along with any kind of social norms, political norms. I try to speak the truth as it is, and because of it, I have enemies on both sides. Um, the liberals think I'm too conservative, and the conservatives think I'm too liberal, nobody likes me. Um, but that is the life of a Christian many times. So, I just give it, my life is not my own, it is in the hands of God, and, um, and, the life that I live, you know, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So if they are able to kill me and I stay dead and God doesn't bring me back, you know, I can stay in heaven forever. My, my troubles are over. They'd be doing me a favor. So, um, but yes, if you'd like to uh, support this ministry so we can reach more people with the truth of the, the you know, the true truth of God's word uh, as it is written in the Bible, without a lot, without you know human opinions and stuff added in and social norms corrupting it, um, you know, please, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, support us as God leads you. And thank you so much for listening today. And God bless you. Bye.